Good morning. Well, uh, John quoted John Calvin, and I'll quote Charles Spurgeon to wish all of you mothers a happy Mother's Day. I know that this can be a painful day for some. I, my mother died many years ago, so I know it can be a painful day, but we do want to honor the mothers among us. So Charles Spurgeon said this, never could it be possible for any man to estimate what he owes to a godly mother. That is true. Well, if you brought your Bible this morning, and I hope you did, please turn with me to the book of Acts. We're continuing our series in the book of Acts this morning. We'll be in chapter 2. We're looking at the, the final section of chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. If you don't have a Bible, we do have Bibles in the back uh, table there by the door. Uh, if you don't own a Bible, that'd be our gift to you, so please take that with you. Before we get started this morning, I have two books to recommend. So these are not books that we sell at our, at our table out there. We don't sell tables to make money or anything like that, but we want to put good resources in your hands. So this book just came out. This book is a book uh, aimed at teenagers. So this is called This Changes Everything, How the Gospel Transforms the Teen Years by Jaquel Crow. Uh, I have been reading this book. Uh, I'm not a teenager. I am long past the teenage years. No surprise to any of you that can see the gray in my beard. But uh, this has been a delightful book to read, and uh, in fact, it has a chapter on community, which is what we're addressing this morning, that I found particularly helpful uh, in crafting this message. So that's called This Changes Everything. So teenagers, pick that up. Parents, pick that up. Second book that I want to recommend that is, uh, that is specifically applicable to the message this morning. This would be uh, John and I were talking recently about books that we would recommend. We said, if there were five books that you would want to put in the hand of every Christian, which five books would those be? And I'm going to steal a book from his list because he has a better list than my list. Mine is mostly Calvin and Hobbes and Ben Hogan on playing golf. Um, so John recommended True Community by Jerry Bridges. Uh, I had not read this book. <laughs> I had not read one of John's top five books, and so I picked it up. I did own it. I picked it up off my shelf this week in preparation for this message. And to my delight, my wife has just littered this book with underlining and highlighting. Uh, she is a voracious reader of good theology. Uh, this is a fantastic book by a fantastic author uh, who passed away last year, but he is a gift to the church. I would, I've read many of Jerry Bridges' books, and I would heartily recommend anything that Jerry Bridges has written. Uh, this book, True Community, is a wonderful exposition of the biblical practice of koinonia, uh, which is the Greek word translated fellowship or partnership in our New Testament. So there you go. So two book recommendations for you. Again, just always wanting to put good resources in your hands for your good. All right. Acts chapter 2. Please join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning and thank you, Father, for creating us. Thank you, Father, for sustaining us. Thank you, Father, for keeping us alive through the night, Lord, when we lay there passively, just completely dependent upon you with our heads on the pillows and our eyes closed, Father. You keep us alive, Father. Thank you for the gift of your church. Thank you, Father, as we reference these books uh, on community, Father, for the gift of your people, Father, for the bride of Christ, your design, Father, of your people. We thank you, Father. We thank you to be counted among them. As we prayed in our prayer meeting before the service today, we thank you, Father, for the gift of salvation, for the gift that it is to be your children, for the gift that it is to be, count to be counted righteous in your sight, that you look upon us and you smile you see us as your beloved children, righteous because, not because of our own righteousness, God, but because of the righteousness of, of another. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for giving us faith and new life and hope in Jesus Christ. Please be with us now, Father. Help us to lean into your word, Father. We want to hear from you, God. We don't want to hear just from some man and his wisdom, God, but from you, from our living God. Teach us, Father. Speak to us. Help us to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Please follow along as I read. This is the word of our Lord. 
And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Well, I've been excited uh, for a number of weeks now to preach this passage, to look at it alongside with you because it is a glorious, a marvelous passage from the Word of God. It is a marvelous passage. It's the first of six uh, summary statements in the book of Acts. Luke has these sections where he, he takes a concentrated selection of verses and he communicates a lot of things in this short section. It's a summary statement of what the church was like. It's, it's, like, a, uh, it's like a snapshot of the church. It's like you peeked in the windows. Uh, I don't know if, you, if many of you have gone to, uh, uh, for, to the Bethlehem in Burnet. Uh, so Burnet, a town adjacent, you know, just down the road here, uh, every year they put on what they call Bethlehem and Burnet, and it's a window into what it was like in the first century at the time of Jesus' birth. And so you walk around and interact with people, and you see uh, people making bread and people making butter, and you see uh, the jailers throwing people in jail for, uh, for not paying their taxes or various things. It's a really fascinating experience. Well, this, these summary statements are like a window into the life of the early church. And so we look in and we see what their life was like. This wasn't just a moment. So we just looked at the sermon that, that Peter preached, was a, which was a once, you know, a moment in time, a sermon that he preached. Well, this is more a description of their life together, of the community of God's people in their life together. The thing I love about this section is that, as you know, we are a church that is, our authority is the Bible. We do not look to leadership books and church books on ecclesiology. We do those things, but our authority and the foundation for all that we do in the life of our church is the Bible. And you can trace almost everything that we do, all of our practices, they can be located in this section. So they're gathering together and they're having fellowship and get up paying attention to the apostolic teaching, the breaking of bread and the prayers, uh, on and on. You see all these things located here in this section. I'm also excited about this text because as I prepared for this sermon, <laughs> we're in a season of weakness in my family. My wife is pregnant and she's very sick and we benefited we have been benefiting ongoing. We're benefiting today. Right now, my children are in other people's arms and in other classes. Uh, we're being cared for. We're experiencing the type of fellowship, the type of care, the type of sacrificial service that we see in this text. So thank you for the way that you already live this out, church. It is a joy to come to you this morning, not preaching this as a correction but preaching this as an encouragement and a keep on pursuing this. Well, Acts chapter 2 records the day of Pentecost. After Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven, the Spirit falls. The gospel, the good news of Jesus, is, of Jesus Christ, is preached with boldness. Chapter 2, verse 36, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And the result of this bold proclamation, the effect of it, the effect of it is that sinners, sinners who were lost and separated from God were saved. They were saved by relying on the crucified and risen Lord, their Savior, for the forgiveness of their sins. And those who were saved were gathered together, they were joined together in community, in fellowship with one another as the church in Jerusalem. Now, the risen Savior feels very strongly that these, these ransom people, these people that he has redeemed by his blood, be gathered together in community, so much so that he shed his own blood on the cross to purchase that bride, to purchase the church for himself. He wasn't saving individuals primarily, but a people. He's gathering a people for himself. And he rose, he rose victorious over sin and death, as we sang earlier these glorious truths in these songs about 
the truth of the gospel. And now he has ascended into heaven where he now, Revelation 1 through 3, he now walks among the lampstands. That is the churches, the local churches. The sovereign Lord of all the earth is actively present, involved with his people in the church. When someone comes to faith and joins a church community, who is it that gathers them there together? Who is it that places them there? Who is it that calls them there? Verse 47, the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. This is the Lord's work. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our sight. This is not our doing. This is not our plan, but it is the God of the universe's plan for his people. Well, here's a question that I want you, that I'd like you to consider this morning. If you, if you thought about Satan, this, the prince of darkness, if he were to launch an all-out attack on us, on God's people, how would he go about that? How would he do that? Would he send persecution our way? Would, he, would it look like everybody running around crazed and demon-possessed? No, that would be far too subtle for Satan. Here's what Satan's strategy would be. Satan first would blind people to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It would be to have people in an environment like this singing songs like we just sang, and yet with hearts that are cold and indifferent to his glory. I went through the first 25 years of my life just like that. I went through the first 25 years of my life blind to the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. I went to church periodically, not regularly, but I went to church and I knew the answers. I grew up in Arlington, Texas, which is smack dab in the buckle of the Bible belt. So I knew what Christianity basically, you know, was in one sense. I could answer all of your questions and tell you how to go to heaven, but it meant nothing to me. What did it mean to be a Christian? I've, I would have said I was a Christian. What did that mean? Well, nothing at all. It means that when you die, you say Jesus, you go to heaven, you get a harp. <laughs> I didn't care. It didn't mean anything to me. I had no effect in my life, no fruit in my life whatsoever. I was indifferent. And I say this, I say this to you because I know that in any gathering of this size, there are always those present among us who are there right now, who are, who might be voicing, mouthing the words of these songs and yet do not see the glory that causes us to sing. We do it out of, because the people around us are doing, because dad says, this is what we do. And yet we don't see the glory of our savior. I'm, <laughs> I'm glad you're here this morning. And I want to appeal to you this morning, if that is you this morning, if you come here and you sing these songs or you, or you sit here out of obedience or out of submission or because somebody drug you here, uh, I want to appeal to you this morning. First, I believe God has brought you here. I believe that God has brought you here for a purpose this morning. And I'm praying for you that as you listen to the preaching of God's word, that maybe for the first time, the gospel will be glorious to you. That maybe for the first time, the, the, the penny drops and th something clicks. And the gospel goes from you know, just facts that we recite to reason for singing. So that's what I'm praying for you this morning. So Satan's number one strategy of attack on us is to blind people to the glory of God in Jesus Christ. But that's not all that he does. He has another strategy as well. If he's launching an all-out attack, I'm convinced that Satan would also do this. He would work to undermine a biblical understanding of the local church. He would have us think small and unworthy thoughts about biblical community and fellowship. Here's what he does. Satan works to belittle, to belittle the bride of Christ. Satan is fine with people being part of a church community so long as you take it for granted, so long as it doesn't really mean anything to you and that you don't think about it too much. And so we need people. We need people with courage to develop biblical convictions about the pri uh, primacy and the priority of biblical community, of the local church. We need people to fight against the spirit of the age, to fight against the prince of darkness. We need people to fight against that ancient vote, to recapture that biblical value that we see here in this ancient text of God's word, of the biblical importance of being the bride of Christ in devoted community together. Amen. That's what we're after. So that's what I'm praying for this morning. But I do so, I do so aware, friends, that 
I've had conversations with you, and I've experienced this too. We've experienced disappointment in the local church, whether here or somewhere else. We have been hurt and wounded in various ways. We have been discouraged. Many of us have experienced sin in the local church in one form or another, whether that's the failure of a leader, sin from another member, the failure of churches simply to live out the holiness that we're called to. And that can leave us disillusioned and discouraged and slow to give of ourselves, slow to be, as the text describes the Christians here, devoted to the community, devoted to the fellowship. Does that describe you? Devoted. Not just present, but devoted. And I think the response to this is, again, to develop biblical convictions. To develop biblical convictions about what God calls us to a biblical view of God's people, a biblical view of God's church. And we need him to impart that to us. We're aware of the onslaught of our ancient foe to belittle the bride of Christ, to draw our attention to her imperfections, to her shortcomings, her failures, and to leave us with a sort of apathy or self-righteous indignation. More of a, we come here to evaluate and to judge and to criticize rather than to devote ourselves. The weariness, friends, of loving unlovely people affects all of us. And so we need God's heart to be implanted within us. Charles Spurgeon, I'm going to reference him a lot today. Reference him once, we'll reference him again. He said this, the church is not perfect. You can say amen. <laughs> the church is not perfect, but woe to the man who finds pleasure in pointing out her imperfections. Christ loved his church. He loves his church. He loves you. And let us do the same. I have no doubt that the Lord can see more fault in his church than I can. And I have equal confidence that he sees no fault at all. Because he covers her faults with his own love. That love which covers a multitude of sins and he removes all her defilement with that precious blood which washes away all, all, all the transgressions of his people. So that's what I'm praying for this morning, friends. That's my hope is that God, through his word, through his magnificent, glorious vision and his wisdom for the church, his bride purchased by his blood, in looking at this description of his church and his word, that he would impart something of his heart, his affection, his vision of his people to us. I'm praying that God would impart to us the same convictions about the community of God's people that he has. So what I want to show you this morning in this section of God's word, what I believe this text teaches us is that as the gospel goes forth, as it advances in the world, the inevitable result is the establishment of gospel community called the church, local churches. God God wants us to love the church as he loves the church. So much, so much so that we would have a passion for the church, that we'd be passionate about his bride as he is. But what we'll see is that he empowers what he commands. The central truth that I want you to see today in this passage is this. The presence of God produces a devoted community for God. The presence of God produces a devoted community for God. My outline this morning is simple. Point one, God's presence among his people. Point two, God's priorities for his people. And point three, God's plan to multiply his people. So point one, first point, the first truth that I want to draw your attention to is that God is present with his people. God is present among us. God is present with his church here in this text. So Luke, what he's doing here, this is not simply a, his, a history lesson. Some people look at the book of Acts as simply a history of God's people. It is that. It is not simply that. It is not primarily that. Luke's extensive summary here is much more than a historical statement of the first months of the Christian church. It is that, but it's more than that. Luke's account is also a theological statement. He's revealing something about God, not just his people. He's revealing something about God, and that is that he is present among the community of believers. The title of our series, The Advancing Gospel of Jesus Christ, we're, we're intentional in that phrasing. We're intentional in that phrasing because it is the gospel that advances through the people of God, but it's the work of God through his spirit, through his presence that affects the advance. 
not simply his people. It is through the people, but it's by his presence. It's his presence that makes things happen. You see this in the apostolic teaching. You see this in the teaching that they were devoted to. You see this throughout these first chapters of the book of Acts, the teaching of the apostles focused on the fulfillment of God's promises in Jesus. If you look at that sermon by Peter, he focused on the promises fulfilled in Jesus, the Messiah and Lord of Israel, and in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was a fulfillment of prophecy. At the end of Matthew's gospel, chapter 28, Jesus told his followers what? To go out and to make disciples. And do you remember what he said at the end there? I will be with you. I will be with you always to the end of the age. That's our hope. That's our promise. It's not all up to us. We are called to play a part. We are called to be responsible. We are called to be devoted. We are called to proclaim, to make disciples, to devote ourselves to community. But it's God who's with us. That's our, that's our assurance. Then in Acts 2, we read about the day of Pentecost. We read about the initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit among his people as a fulfillment of prophecy and the promises of God. And in this section 2, here at the end of chapter 2, we see the presence of God both anticipated and at work in the people of God in various ways. So how do we see that? The breaking of bread. The breaking of bread. When we do the breaking of bread, which you know, could be a technical reference to the Lord's Supper, is more, more likely just a reference to the meals that they share together. We share meals regularly as a church. And in the, in the, new, in the first church, you know, in the first century, it was like that as well. They're regularly in each other's homes sharing meals. And as they did that, the breaking of bread reminds the believers of the cross of Christ. Jesus' body and blood broken and poured out for them and of God's plan of salvation accomplished. The people experience the awe-inspiring presence of God in the miracles that we just read about. It says, awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. Awe came upon them. They were aware of God's presence. They said, surely God is in this place. That is not the hand of man. That is the hand of God. The believers experienced God's presence, and they prayed prayers of praise in which they, in which they professed uh, gratefulness to God. For his blessings through Jesus. They experienced God's effective presence in the new conversions and the continued growth of the church that we read about last week in verse 41. It says that the Lord added 3,000 to that day, and we see it again at the end of this section, verse 47. The Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. All this, friends, all this is to draw attention to the point that whatever God calls us to, it's his power and his presence that go with us, and that's our assurance. It's also to draw attention to the fact that these people were not insular. They weren't inward focused. They were a God-centered people. They, were, they had a Godward perspective of life. They loved one another and they were devoted to one another, but not before they loved God and were devoted to him. One of the greatest theological minds of our day, J.I. Packer, said this about this passage. Fellowship with God then is the source from which fellowship among Christians springs. And fellowship with God is the end to which Christian fellowship is a means. Before we can have fellowship with one another, we must have fellowship with God. 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you that you may have fellowship with us. That's that word that Bridges talks about, koinonia. We have it here in our passage, fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is is with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It's first upward before it's horizontal. First, our fellowship is with God, then it's with others. Fellowship with God is the beginning of our Christian fellowship. It's the end of our Christian fellowship. Our fellowship now with one another, the community that we experience among and with the people of God is a foretaste of what we'll have for all of eternity. It's a foretaste of heaven. This right here, friends, this is a foretaste of heaven. Our fellowship with God, though, it changes us. His presence affects a certain change about us. It brings about, it produces something in us. In encountering the presence of God earlier in chapter 2, the effect is this section. This section is kind of like, it, it's kind of like a math equation. You've got this plus this equals this. And so what we see in the first couple of chapters ends up here in verse 42. This is what happens. In encountering the presence of God, it produces a community of God, a devoted community toward one another. 
This was true for the first Christians. This is true for us today. Before we just give ourselves to meeting together, before we just give ourselves to building and strengthening the church, and we are called to that. We're not called to you know, put that on the shelf. But first, we're called to encounter the presence of God. That's what we gather for. We gather together to hear the teaching. We gather together for the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We gather together to sing songs of praise. So first, we want to encounter the presence of God, lay claim to the promises of God. And when we do that, we'll see that our affection for the people of God are changed. And that leads us to point two, God's priorities for his people. As I said earlier, Luke doesn't simply give us a history lesson. He gives us a theological statement about God's presence. He also gives us an ecclesiological statement about the priorities of the people of God. When we encounter the presence of God, we simply cannot encounter God and leave unchanged. God's presence reshapes our priorities. He reshapes the things that are important to us, the things that we prioritize. Okay, I love food. <laughs> Amen. You guys talked to me this morning. In fact, I love food so much that I eat it every day. Amen. I love food, but as much as I love food, I don't love food as much as my friend Mark. My friend Mark really loves food. My friend Mark, to eat with him is to have a culinary experience that you will tell your friends about. You will tell your grandchildren about the time that you had dinner with my friend Mark. Mark is not dispassionate about anything. He either loves it, it's amazing, or it's terrible, absolutely terrible. When he describes the details of his favorite dish, there is no way that you can avoid having a, having a desire. I want to taste that. When I go to restaurants with him for the first time, I say, Mark, what do you recommend? And then he'll go through, well, don't get that. that is, that's disgusting. That is terrible. But this, oh, and he describes the layers and the, the way that they prepare it. And you start thinking, oh, I want that. And if you don't love it, then you'll at least be entertained. That, that I guarantee, money back. Well, to encounter the presence of God is to have your desires, your affections, your priorities permanently changed. You love what God loves. There is no equivocation here. The Bible simply has no category for a Christian who does not love the people of God, who does not love the bride of Christ. If you believe otherwise, if you believe that God does not call you to a community of God's people, well, I look forward to your emails this week. And I want to encourage you to go ahead and search through the scriptures and try to find, try to find someone who's commended or encouraged in any way for not being part of a local community of believers. You will not find it. You cannot because it is not there. The gospel and church membership are inseparable. When the Spirit of God transforms our hearts through the proclamation of the gospel, he makes us long to unite together with our family, with the brothers and sisters, the people of God. It demonstrates to us Christ's love for the church, and it calls us to love the church in return. Church historian Stephen, I Stephen Nichols writes about this very thing. He says, when we talk about what it means to be a Christian, we have to be talking about our Christian life in the new redeemed community of the church. No one is an island. Charles Spurgeon. I told you I was going to quote him a lot. Charles Spurgeon said this. I know there are some who say, well, I have given myself to the Lord, but I do, not give, I do not intend to give myself to any church. Now, why not? Well, because I can be a Christian without it. Are you quite clear about that? You can be as good a Christian by disobedience to your Lord's commands as by being obedient. Look, there is a brick. What is it made for? To help build a house. It is of no use for that brick to tell you that it's just as good a brick while it's being kicked around on the ground as it would be in the house. It is a good-for-nothing brick. So, you Rolling Stone Christians, that's a term we need to bring back, <laughs> I do not believe that you are answering your purpose. You are living contrary to the life which Christ would have you live, and you are much to blame for the injury that you do. Well, as I mentioned earlier, in my, up until my mid-20s, I was dispassionate about the church. I was dispassionate about anything having to do with God. I acknowledged certain facts, but it was simply that, facts that I recited, and it meant nothing to my heart. It meant nothing to my affections whatsoever. I never thought about God or the church. But once God gave me his new life, once he put his spirit in me, boom, my affections were changed. My affections were changed radically, not completely, but radically. Radically. 
God gave me a heart for his word. I didn't go from sin struggler to perfected saint overnight. I'm still not there. I don't have that testimony. But what I can say emphatically and with loads of external testimony is that when I encountered God, my, my affections were forever changed about his word, Jesus Christ, my Savior, and his people. I wanted to be with the church. I didn't just go from thinking the party scene was boring to looking for something better. I liked the party scene, but I tasted something better. I saw something lasting, something true, something worth giving up everything else, something worth setting all my attention to, something worth devoting to. This section, this section of Scripture describes the effect of the presence of God on these first believers. The presence of God produces something that has an effect. They heard the proclamation of the gospel. The Spirit gave them new hearts. They repented of their sin, were baptized in the community of God's people. Their affections were changed, and their priorities were reshaped. Here's the point. The presence of God produced a devoted community for God. They didn't simply decide to go about and do something different. No, there was a supernatural change brought about by the presence of God, by their life and union with Christ, purchased by his body and his blood. Suddenly, they're part of the family of God, members of one another. This like conversion was God's doing. It was his work. This summary in verse 42 described the the fundamentals, the essentials of the life of the church. So we don't have time this morning to, to look in depth and to break down every single one of them, but let's look quickly at some of these items that, that they were giving themselves to, that they were devoting to in verse 42. Teaching by the apostles. Teaching by the apostles is and always must remain central in the church. We are a church that gather together to read God's word. We're not simply, again, we're not simply looking at the best-selling books over at you know, the, the Christian bookstore. We're not simply gathering together to consider what would be good for the people of God to do. No, we are gathering together to give primacy, to devote ourselves to the teaching of the apostles, to, teach, to give it, attention to the teaching of God's word. Fellowship. We already mentioned here the word here is koinonia. First instance of, this is the first instance of this word in the Bible, but it's mentioned several other times. It's translated here fellowship. It can also be mentioned, uh, referenced as partnership or sharing, specifically a common life with believers. It's a shared common life. We are living stones being built together into a spiritual house, as Spurgeon said, bricks. Bricks being built together, building something. It, the point is not the brick. The point is what that brick is building, what it's part of, the structure, the community, the God's, you know, God's people. It's not the fact that we're united in common goals or purposes that make us a community. Rather, it's the fact that we share a common life in Christ. There are many organizations, friends, both, both religious and secular, that have common goals and have common purposes. We rally together, and we do participate in many of them. I'm part of various communities in certain way, respects there. Some of them reference themselves as communities. But biblical community goes much deeper than sharing common goals, common purposes. Biblical community is, first of all, the sharing of a common life in Christ. It, it also implies a responsibility, a responsibility to fulfill our function in the body. We usually don't think in, of our fellowship in terms of a responsibility. We think of it as something nice. We think of small group as this optional extra thing that, well, that's nice for those people that need that. But no, it's, it, it's our responsibility. It says that they're devoted to one another. 1 Corinthians 12 says that we are all gifted in certain ways for the purpose of the strengthening of the body. How are you participating in that? How are you doing that? How are you being obedient, uh, fulfilling your responsibility before the Lord for the purpose of the body if you don't gather together with the body? Right. Fellowship is not simply a social privilege to enjoy, but it's a responsibility to assume. The breaking of bread. We already referenced this. Most likely, you know, it, it could include, it could reference the technical meaning of the Lord's Supper. Certainly they did that, but it's also something a, a broader, you know, they're eating together in their homes. You do this well. We uh, right now are just enjoying, you know, the breaking of bread in various ways. Some of you are bringing meals over and eating with us and, and others dropping it off. And we, we, I just want to commend you as a church for the way that you give yourselves to these times. When we gather together as a church corporately to share meals, you come together and you are serving and participating and looking for opportunities to invest and enjoy one another. Prayer. They were devoted to prayer. 
In fact, it says that we are devoted to the prayers. The plural form here suggests that the reference is to specific prayers, which would make sense in their context because they were at the temple day by day. And certainly there were, there were scripted prayers that they gave themselves to, but it was more than that. Their eating together involved praising God. Doubtless, they prayed together in groups. Doubtless, when they were gathered together, they would stop and pray for various things. We see instances of that throughout the Bible. They would stop and pray for boldness. They would stop and pray for Peter to be released from prison. They would stop and pray for the gospel to advance, to go forth. Prayer was certainly an important part of their community life and of apostolic leadership. The community of God's people prays because we seek direction from above. We are dependent upon God's wisdom because God's family do not work by feelings or intuition or strategy, but by actively submitting ourselves to the Lord's direction. So when we're thinking about a change of life, we pray, we seek God, we ask others to pray with us. When we have various needs, we appeal to the Lord for mercy. We gather together every week before our meeting in corporate prayer to intercede for one another, to pray for the work of the gospel, to advance in our community here locally and around the world like Mario in Croatia. We pray. Just as these first believers are devoted to these things, so should we. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, we don't want to simply give ourselves to, to these things um, out of obedience, but we want to develop biblical convictions this is what God calls us to. This is God's plan. We want to have biblical convictions. We want to pass those on to our children. I want my children to have convictions about the local church. I want my children, when one day when I'm gone, when I'm dead and gone, I want my children to have convictions about the primacy of the local church. It's not simply something we do as Texans. It's not something we do as Americans. It's something that we do because we are called by God to do it. And as we do that, we will see the gospel go forth. That leads to our final point, God's plan to multiply his people. These are the effects of a gospel community. Pardon me. Lost my place. Where are we? All right, Acts 2. Great. Bible. Great. All right, Acts 2.42. Everybody knows this verse. Tens of thousands of sermons have been preached in Acts 2.42. This is John Stott. He says, this illustrates the danger of isolating a text from, his context, from its context. This, friends, this served as a rebuke to me this week. I was preparing the sermon, and I was simply going to basically spend all my time in verse 42 and think that the rest of this is all supporting of it. And what John Stott says is that on its own, verse 42 presents a very lopsided picture of the church's life together. Verse 47 needs to be added, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Verse 41, the Lord added 3,000 souls to their midst. Those first Jerusalem Christians were not so preoccupied with their life together. They were doing that. They were devoted to that. They were devoted to the fellowship. Okay, so they were a devoted community, but they were not so preoccupied with learning and sharing and worshiping that they forgot about witnessing. God's intention is to add people to his church. Now, it is not my plan or prayer. It is not John or Bart. You know, as, we, as we talk and strategize, our goal is not to build a big church. We, we want to be faithful. We're, we're, not, we're not thinking, how can, we, how can we get more people in here? Now, we certainly want to see the gospel advance. We certainly want to see conversions. We want to see people being saved and added to the people of God, absolutely, when we see the advancing work of the gospel. And yet, our goal is not primarily, you know, growth in that regard. But God intends to add people to his church. A, a authentic church does grow. This passage isn't a call to evangelism, and, that, and yet the implicit truth here is that they were going about proclaiming the gospel to others. They were seeing converts consistently as they met together. Luke highlights both the behavior of believers and the sovereign determination of God in this passage. Passage. As the message of salvation was proclaimed and the disciples testified to, testified to its truth in every fast of its life, because they, that's what they were doing when they were gathering together. They were testifying to the truth of the gospel. In doing that, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Peter Jeffrey says, The most contagious thing the world has ever seen is, 
is a church whose life, message, and love reflect the character of Jesus. Don't you want that? Do you want people to say that about our church? Such a life is like fire. It spreads quickly and nothing can stand before it. We've all experienced, I know that we've experienced disappointments with the church. We've also seen the glory of God's plan for the church. I was saved in that context in a group of believers who actually believed that this is real, that this is true, that it means something for your life, that this is better than whatever else the, Lord, the, the world has to offer you. That's how I was saved. I know many of you, I've heard your testimonies share a similar story. The growth happens, friends, by the power of God. It is his doing. The Lord is the one who added to their number, and the Lord is the one who will add to our number. The growth happened in response to the priorities of teaching and fellowship and practicing God's presence and his power. The growth happened in conjunction with the people of God devoting themselves to one another and living a lifestyle that displayed the beauty of the gospel. And others began to take notice and say, hey, I want some of that. That's what we want. This description of the first, of the first Christians describes what one author calls a compelling community. It's a compelling community. It's a compelling witness. It's a compelling testimony. What we do here is a compelling testimony to the truth of the gospel. What would happen? What would happen? What would it look like for Christians around the world to be reignited in this kind of faith in our time today? What would it look like for us to become those who live most beautifully, love most deeply, and serve most faithfully in the places that we live and work every day? What would it look like for Christians to become the first place where people go for comfort when a life-altering crisis comes upon them? What would it look like when anxiety and depression, and when a child goes astray, when a job is lost, when a spouse files for divorce, and the church is the first place that they want to turn to? What would it look like for a woman with a crisis pregnancy to see the local church rather than the clinic as the place that she can trust for love, for care, for non-judgment, for practical support, wise counsel, and care? What would it look like for the local church to become the most diverse and welcoming rather than the most homogeneous and inhospitable community on earth? Friends, you are a hospitable and welcoming church. I love that about you. I love that when visitors come in our midst, they don't leave ungreeted. They don't leave unloved and uncared for. May that multiply in our midst. What would it look like for Christians to become not only the best kinds of friends, but also the best kinds of enemies, returning <coughs> insults with kindness, returning persecution with prayer? What would it look like for the Lord to add to our number day by day those who are being saved, not in spite of Christians, but because of Christians. Gandhi is famous. There's a famous quote that you've probably heard. He said, I like your Christ, but not your Christians. What would it look like for people to say, I like your Christ because of your Christians? That's the kind of life together that we're appealing for. As one author said, we draw people to Christ, not by loudly discrediting what they believe, but by, or by telling them how wrong they are and how right we are, but rather by showing them a light so lovely that they want with all their hearts to know the source of it. Amen. Let's live life that way together. Listen, friends, the world is thirsty for awe. It says that awe came upon all the people. The world is thirsty for that kind of, that's amazing. We, we see that because we see the, the viral videos that go around that produce awe as the, as the cat does acrobatics or obeys any command whatsoever or anything else. We, we are a people thirsty for awe. The world is thirsty for people to point to something that leaves them with that. So we want to live our lives in such a way that we stand out as distinct from the world, not due to self-righteousness, but because we have something far better than the world has to offer, the gospel of Jesus Christ that declares that whoever you are, whatever your background, Whatever mess that you've made, any person, any person who professes faith in Christ, 
who's baptized in his name, is cleansed from their guilt, given new life, hope for change, and eternal life. The gospel declares that life is short, eternity is long, and we get the God of all creation as our heavenly Father who will lavish his affection and his glory on us now and forever. In closing, we want to remember the strategy of Satan. We want to remember that he first seeks to hide the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, but we also want to be aware that he works to undermine a biblical view of God's people, the bride of Christ. He would have us think small and unworthy thoughts about the local church and Christian community and fellowship. So we want to combat that. We want to combat that by developing biblical convictions, by asking God for courage to live like this, devoted to the teaching, devoted to fellowship and the breaking of bread and the prayers. We want to live our life together as it says here that they were, they were self-sacrificial in the way that they lived. They were selling possessions and belongings, serving one another. Over and over it says together, together, together. They were doing this together, they were doing this together, they were doing this together. God calls us to live life together as the bride of Christ. There really is no replacement for the time and intentionality that it takes to build God's people, to be God's people. It takes work. It also seems that there's no lack of tasks to be done, of errands to run, of responsibilities to complete each day that make this kind of life, a devoted life, seem out of reach. There's always something else that's vying for our attention. But let's remember as we study this book together, as we think about this passage together, that the early church had hurdles to overcome too. They had people knocking down their doors and throwing them in jail. They had people that were persecuting them in a way that we don't know, that people in other parts of the world do know. The life the early church enjoyed can be ours as well. But first, we want to ask the Lord to increase our devotion to him, to experience his presence, and to affect that change in our priorities. As I said earlier, this isn't a, a corrective statement at all. You, you do this well. We want to continue to do this all the more and to multiply that number. May we love the community God has called us to and has given us in this church. May we love who they are as God does. We want to love one another, friends, as we are, not some future version of one another. God doesn't love, there's a pastor up in Dallas who regularly says, God doesn't love a future version of you. He loves you today, where you are right now. He is committed to changing you. He is conforming you to his image as we behold his glory. But he loves you where you are, as you are. We want to ask God for that same heart for one another. We want to ask God to give us that kind of devotion to one another, the same devotion that he has for us. In doing that, what we believe about the gospel is reflected in the way that we live out the gospel. The way that we cover over offenses reveals our grasp of the gospel. The way that we forgive one another reveals our grasp of the gospel. The way that we devote one another reveals what we believe about the bride of Christ purchased by his blood. Please join me in prayer. Well, Father in heaven, we again give thanks to you, O oh Lord. We thank you for loving us, for dying for us, for saving us, for redeeming us by your blood, for giving us salvation. We thank you for your presence, God, that whenever we, are ga whenever we gather, you are with us. We thank you for the promise of our Savior, Matthew 28, that you will be with us always to the end of the age. We pray, God, that you would inspire our hearts with the same love for your people that you have for your people. God, give us that kind of biblical conviction, Lord, about the priority of community, about the priority of God's people, about the priority of building your church, God, proclaiming your gospel, displaying your glory in our midst. And Father, I pray that you would give us grace to do this. Give us grace to love the church. Give us grace, Father, to overlook imperfections. Give us grace, Father, to look on the bride with affection as you do. Give us passion, Father. I pray, Father, for those here this morning, God, 
for, who are unconvinced, for those who do not see your glory, God, who are here this morning and indifferent, Father, I pray right now that you would quicken to their hearts, Father, faith, that you would reveal to them your glory. I pray, Father, for those who have been hurt by your church, for those who are disillusioned or discouraged, God, that you would give them a biblical conviction about the kind of hearts and the kind of priorities that we should have about your pride. And I pray, Father, that you would give each of us, Father, fresh faith to love your people as you love your people. Let us live this out. And as we do this, Father, I do pray that you would add to your, add to your household those who are being saved. We pray this for the glory of your name, through the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.